Bob, you're up. Okay, can I start? <clears throat> okay, yep. good morning, everyone, and good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining this uh, session of uh, PAC 48, where we will consider uh, a group of, uh, of approved uh, experiments and one groups um, in, in the Jeopardy uh, category uh, this year. Um, so uh, just a reminder that uh, we, we finalized this policy in a discussion with the user group for the directors back in 2016. And uh, we plan to use the normal annual PAC meeting for about four years to address all of the, as of 2016, all the proposals that were approved, uh, but had not been fully scheduled. And, um, and uh, plus new proposals that have come in uh, in the meantime. And um, so we started in 2019 and we hope to catch up uh, and reach a steady state in 2024 where all proposals that have been have been approved for four years or more, but not scheduled, will be considered in jeopardy. So we're still playing catch up with this uh, program. We <coughs> um, uh, distributed these three questions to uh, the PAC members and also to the uh, uh, spokespersons uh, as a guideline for what the PAC will be considering. Uh, in this uh, in, in this jeopardy uh, session. So the first is: Is there any new information that would affect the scientific importance or impact of the experiment since it was originally proposed? Uh, the second: If the experiment has already received a portion of its allocated bean time, or is on the presently published and or is on the presently published accelerator schedule. Spokespersons should provide an analysis of the existing data set, the projected result for any additional time that is on the published schedule, and the projected result for the complete data set, including all remaining unscheduled time. And the goal is to show the physics impact of the respective data sets uh, so that the PAC has a, has a clear view of uh, the uh, relative uh, importance of the different uh, sets of data. And uh, thirdly, should the remaining bean time allocation and experiment grade be reconsidered? So the PAC can uh, reconsider uh, both the bean time and uh, the remaining bean time and the uh, experiment grade uh, for the uh, proposal going forward. Uh, and this is the list, I believe, the correct list that out of the spreadsheet that we have <coughs> of the uh, uh, proposals that we'll be discussing today, uh, and I think everyone is aware of that. We have an agenda. We don't go in, in, in this order, but uh, we try to arrange the order that would uh, be a little more convenient for people in time zones. So I hope that all works out. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's all I have uh, to uh, <coughs> to present <coughs> in uh, the way of getting everybody ordered here. I don't know if there are any questions uh, from the committee for me or Marcus Point. Um, stop sharing. Okay, I guess maybe all is clear. Um, so, Marcus, uh, would you like to uh, begin the session? I guess for maybe a couple minutes early, but since yes, I think, here, maybe we... Yes, I think we might, may, may as well begin. Um, so, thank you, Bob, for the introduction. Um, hope everything is clear. Uh, to all the speakers of this and the next sessions, um, as you know, if you have uh, 30 minutes on the schedule, that means 20 minutes uh, and... Uh, uh, 10 minutes for discussion and for the 20 minutes talks I will give you a warning that your time is almost up uh, when uh, you have five minutes left. For the experiments they have 20 minutes in total that is 15 minutes plus five and in that case I will uh, tell you when you have three minutes left. I will have to cut you off when your time is over relatively sharply because we have such a um, dense schedule today. Um, 
please uh, bear with me on that, but uh, we wouldn't be able to function otherwise. So with this, I would like to call on the first speaker. It's uh, Annalisa D'Angelo uh, from Rome, who will present an update on uh, Hall B Run Group K. So I leave it to Annalisa and Lorelei to do the technicalities, and then please go ahead. I'm sharing the screen. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. So I, I am on uh, the full uh, uh, display of, of the of the slides. Shall I start? Go ahead, yeah. please. Okay. So, uh, as you announced, uh, uh, I'm, I am Annalisa D'Angelo, and I will present the Hall B Run Group A physics program, which is dedicated to the study of color confinement and strong QCD. The Run Group encompasses the three experiments that are here shown, a search for hybrid variants in Hall B with class 12, nuclear resonance structure studies via exclusive KY electroproduction at 6.6 .6 and 8.8 GV, and deep libertal compass scattering with plus 12 and 6.6 .6 and 8.8 GV. This uh, experiments uh, basically uh, share the same class 12 configuration and address complementary aspects of uh, strong QCD. The PIs are here listed. The run group was approved by PAC44, in 2016 to run for 100 PAC days, equally shared uh, between the two uh, energies, 8.8 uh, .8 and 6.6 .6 GB, and opportunistically took data in uh, 2018 uh, for uh, 12 PAC days at 7.5 GB and 6.5 GB. This is the only run group which uh, has been approved to run at energies lower than the maximum. So, uh, following what uh, was presented by Bob, uh, the hope, of, uh, the, the scope of this uh, presentation is to address the charges, uh, which is answering the three fundamental questions. So, we will show the latest de developments in the field to answer the question if there is new information, and we hope and we uh, prove that the proposed experiments have maintained and possibly increased the scientific interest. Uh, then, uh, since we took 10% uh, of the data, uh, we will show the uh, results of the analysis of the collected data and uh, showing the impact of the, the data set, uh, hoping that uh, there is enough information to uh, uh, get the uh, projected statistics and uh, to show that it's indeed uh, uh, necessary to complete the scientific program. And uh, based on the physics impact of the data, uh, we are posing the request of upgrading from A minus to A, the scientific um, rating of the experiment of the run group, and we request the remaining 88 PAC approved days. So uh, the series of uh, run group K proposals uh, Mains, uh, aims at answering three main questions. What is the status of the N star spectrum and what is the role of the group? And uh, in particular, the first experiment uh, aims at establishing the nuclear excitation spectrum, searching for states in the high mass region and looking for hybrid variants which are characterized by the excitation of explicit degluons degrees of freedom. The second question is how does the role of the active degrees of freedom in the nucleon evolve with distance scale? And to answer this question, the second experiment uh, aims at probing the underlying uh, and stars degrees of freedom in their emergence from the QCD, uh, studying the Q-square evolution of the resonance electrocouplings. The third experiment uh, wants to answer the questions how is color and confinement realized in the force and pressure distribution in uh, stable nucleons? And uh, to, perf to answer these questions, we're going to study GPDs and their moments uh, in the deeply beautiful Compton scattering. So, our understanding of the excited variant spectrum in the high mass region has greatly improved in the last 10 years, and it can be noticed uh, in this table, 
that shows the uh, variant resonances in the range of masses between 1700 and 2200 MeV. Uh, you can see that uh, the status of our knowledge in 2010 as, um, much, much, was much poorer than the present uh, uh, results that are published in the 2020 edition. The main difference is that we have now five new resident states that were discovered mainly from the inclusion of polarized observables uh, that were, are dominated by class data from the associated stranger channels production, K lambda and uh, K sigma. So the scope of the new experiment is to study these states uh, also in electro production and to gather information in the QSPR evolution of the resonance electrocoupling and extend the search to higher masses range. The potential of discovery of class data uh, is here shown. Uh, because uh, by the, uh, in this uh, latest uh, publication uh, dated 2020, uh, combined and allied analysis of uh, pi plus pi minus p data from both photo production and electro production uh, was able to uh, assess the existence of a, a new resonance and prime 1723 half plus, which uh, uh, from which, that is basically uh, completely uh, de deduced uh, from uh, class data, as I said. And uh, for the first time, also, uh, despite the existence, the Q square evolution of this resonance uh, was uh, studied. So, uh, with this in mind, we want to um, extend our uh, search to hybrid variants. Hybrid variants are, uh, and hybrid hadrons in general, are uh, basically hadrons with the gluonic uh, contributions which are dominant and they are predicted to exist uh, in uh, QCD. Uh, here you see the spectrum that comes from lattice QCD calculated by Joe Dudek and Robert Edwards in 2012, where it is clear that a cluster of uh, hybrid states or states with dominant gluonic degrees of freedom uh, are predicted to exist uh, in an, an energy range which is class, uh, which is 1.3 GeV um, higher than the uh, uh, that, that ground state. They are clustered in a region where there are uh, no ordinary QQQ states, and uh, the population is uh, uh, expected uh, to be higher in the J pi quantum numbers one half plus and three half plus. So um, we are aiming at uh, looking for uh, the existence of these uh, states uh, with the difficulty, however, that uh, the states show the same JP uh, quantum numbers or, or as ordinary variants. So besides uh, looking for an overpopulation of the N one half and N three half bands, we need another signature. The, sig the signature comes from a different Q square evolution of the electrocouplings A1 half and S1 half uh, with respect to the regular variants. Indeed, as an example, let me remind you how we um, could, uh, using class results on electrocoupling from both single pion and double pion channels, uh, assess and clarify the nature of the rotor resonance. For Q squares higher than 1.5 GB, you find nice agreement between the three quark prediction from light front relativistic quark models and from Dyson Schwinger equation with respect to the data uh, for both transverse and, lucid, and uh, longitudinal electrocouplings. However, at lower uh, Q square, uh, you see a disagreement which has been interpreted in terms of meson variant uh, cloud coupling. So this shows a, a complex interplay between the three core core and the external meson variant cloud. If the rover were a hybrid, particle, a hybrid uh, variant, it would have shown the, uh, the, red, the um, fast drop uh, that is here shown by this red line at low Q square values of both uh, A1 half and S1 half. So this would have been the signature for a roper. 
which uh, is now, on the contrary, understood to be basically the first radial excitation of the three quarks day. Uh, finally, uh, we want to uh, assess um, the, uh, the nature of uh, shear forces and, and, the, uh, and the pressure in the, in the nucleon. The nucleon matrix elements of the energy momentum tensor is known to contain free form factor. M2, which describes uh, the mass distribution in the nucleon, J, which is, describes the angular momentum distribution, and D1, which describes the pressure. They can be measured directly only in elastic graviton nucleon scattering, which is not access, uh, accessible. However, this form factor also appear as moments of the unpolarized generalized, generalized uh, parton distribution, as it's shown here. So me measuring these form factors, we learn about confinement forces. And since uh, PAC44 approved run group K, uh, actually the pressure, uh, part and pressure uh, distribution inside the nucleon has been measured from class 6 data. And the, the results uh, are here shown and were published in a Nature uh, paper. Uh, that since uh, its publications two years ago, already received 43 uh, citations uh, in the Web of Science in 87 in, in Inspire, showing the importance of the topic, how this is a hot topic. Uh, now let's come to the uh, available data. Uh, as I said, um, uh, Run Group K ran for 12 PSC days. At, in two uh, sets of data taken at 7.5 and then at 6.5 GV with uh, an energy change during which the forward header was turned off. This allowed it to reach a full luminosity at 6.5 GV. The uh, setup of the experiment was such that the torus current corresponded to negative unbending particles to um, extend the Q square reach uh, at low values of the uh, kinematical coverage. Uh, they, 12 PSC days were taken and 7% uh, uh, of the expected uh, charge was accumulated. This corresponds to approximately one-tenth of the full uh, requested and approved uh, uh, beam time. In this uh, tenth, uh, we collected 15.6 uh, gigabands. Data were completely uh, calibrated and reconstructed, and now we show the results of the uh, preliminary analysis. First, we start with the run group K kinematical coverage, as here shown in terms of the Q square versus W uh, invariant quantities. You can see that uh, at 7.5 GV, we could span from 5 to 0.05 uh, G, um, uh, GeV square in, in, in uh, Q square. Um, indeed, and from w, uh, w from uh, okay, the minimum to a maximum of uh, 3, 4 uh, GeV. The top panel shows the acceptance when the electron is detected in the forward tagger the, that goes down to 0.4 GeV square. And uh, the lowest Q square range is obtained when the electron is detected in the forward header. So the uh, phase space where Q square is larger than one is where we look for the evolution of active degrees of freedom in the n-star structure and from the processes. So Q square less than one is where we search for a hybrid variant signature and the meson variant contribution to the n-star structure. The reaction of interest that we are going to uh, show as first results for the N-star and hybrid, pro hybrid uh, program is the 2 pion and the KY electroproduction. The hope is to get the full um, differential cross-section uh, extracting the separated structure function, uh, sigma u, which is sigma t plus epsilon sigma l, sigma t t, sigma l t, and sigma l t prime, uh, binning the results in Q squared W cos theta center of mass of the count and phi. And then extract the recoil and beam recoil apparent polarizations in the same binning, uh, with the final goal extracting the resonance electrocouplings of uh, the uh, star resonances. And, uh, uh, and this requires the uh, development of suitable KY reaction model, which is un in progress 
in collaboration with several theory groups and with uh, collaboration with RAN Group A. In the top panels, you see the coverage in terms of the angular acceptance for K, uh, in the, for the K-on detected in the forward or in the central part of the detector. In order to assess what is the final statistic needed, we are taking uh, as a reference the, the uh, photoreaction statistics that was used for KY by Bongacin analysis, analysis that discovered the new variants in the energy range that I show in the table uh, a few slides ago. The statistical precision was about uh, between 2% and 7%, so we are aiming at a final precision of 4.3%. In a number of uh, binning, uh, that is um, um, enough in order to uh, plot correctly all the um, behavior of the observables. Uh, we need a similar statistics to photo production in order to separate structure functions, find new excited resonances, and extract the Q squared dependence. So if we multiply the number of beans that we require, uh, we reach um, basically 80,000 bins on which we want 4.3% statistics, uh, corresponds to about 600 events, and we aiming, therefore, at a ton of, um, statistics of 40 million events at each energy. Um, the, you have five minutes left. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, uh, we have extracted the uh, yield uh, by plotting the missing mass of the electron plus count detected in the forward detector. You can see here the, the fit that used uh, con convoluted Gaussian uh, with background to minimize a chi-square based on a Monte Carlo simulation. The final statistic that was obtained is here shown. And um, basically is compared with the world data set that was dominated by class with the E1F experiment. The present data are shown in, um, in black numbers, and the, and the projected data is multiplied by 10 by adding uh, a final zero in red. Uh, the overall uh, kinematics uh, already uh, is much larger than the world uh, available data and amounts to a projected uh, statistics of 35 million, which compares with the 40 million we required. And this is necessary to, uh, as I said, uh, obtain for actual production same statistics as photo production. Uh, the Q-square range can be obtained, as I said, using the uh, electron in the forward tagger. Uh, that allows to go as low as 0.05 uh, GV. This is a sample of uh, uh, what is the spectrum for full exclusive kinematics. Um, finally, the uh, yields estimate for 2 pi uh, electro production uh, allows us to project 8 million events in the EP pi minus and 5 million events in the EP pi plus statistics in one bin of W between 2.2 and 2.5 GV. And this will allow us to have uh, nice Q square bins of 0.1 GB square size in the three body final state uh, reaction. For the RUN group K DCBS physics, uh, recall that the special part of the energy momentum tensor can be parameterized to connect the distribution of the pressure and the shear forces um, together to the energy momentum sensor uh, through this relation. And uh, the form factor D1, which we are, we are aiming to, can be related to this uh, PR and SR uh, via spherical uh, Bessel integrals. From the experimental point of view, we are going to measure the beam spin asymmetries, can be parameterized in terms of alpha sin phi and 1 plus beta cos phi as a, as a function of the trend tau angle phi. And from this, alpha can be related to the imaginary part of the DVCS amplitude and beta to the real part. And dispersion relation relates alpha and beta to D1. So this is the um, uh, motivation for which uh, RUN group uh, K requires two beam energies in addition to RUN group A uh, to really address the physics program. Uh, this is because uh, we need two additional energies to separate the beta Heitler uh, interference with the DBCS from the square of the DBCS, which have different uh, evolutions in Y. Uh, 
And uh, moreover, um, we need different beam energies to separate, uh, by Rosen separation, the terms of the cross-section. The coverage uh, in Q squared and X um, is here shown for, uh, uh, for detected data, for collected data, uh, 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 putting together 6.5 and 7.5 GeV. And you can see that putting together the three beam uh, energies that have been requested by rung group A and rung group K, it's possible to span a larger uh, plane in Q square versus X, XY. This is the kinematics of the uh, analyzed data, putting together 6.5 and 7.5 GV. All particles are detected, uh, photons, uh, electrons, and protons. Electrons are detected in the forward tagger, protons both in the, in the forward detector, protons both in the uh, central detector and the forward detector, photons in the forward detector and the forward tagger. The exclusivity allows to um, well reconstruct the uh, events. The available statistics is 1.8 million events. And the full projected statistics is 20 million events, which would be enough to uh, accomplish uh, the uh, uh, physics program. Uh, this is an example of the uh, beam speed asymmetry extraction at different X, uh, X Bjorkin Q square bins. And this uh, is available statistics compared with the uh, projected and proposed statistical accuracy. What we need is appropriate matching with run group A and large kinematical co coverage, which is, which is assured, as I said, uh, with the full statistics and different energies. So to conclude, uh, we um, expect that uh, run group K will address several fundamental open problems in hadron physics, search for new hybrid baryon matter, insight into the emergence of the confined meson baryon cloud and the uh, Q square evolution of the electrocoupling, and uh, shed light on the nature of uh, the nucleon stability through the balance between explosive and implosion patterns, pressure, pressure and shear forces. We have demonstrated that the physics impact of the respective data sets is enough to um, see that the projected final statistics uh, will be uh, allowed the determination of the QSQL evolution of the resonance electrocoupling. We allow to assess the eventual um, hybrid baryon nature of additional uh, identified uh, resonances and uh, to isolate the inference term between beta Heidler and the VCS. Uh, gaining insight into, ener into energy momentum tensor of the QCD and the gra gravitational properties of the nucleon. So we ask for the upgrade from A minus to A of the scientific rating and for the remaining 88 PSC days. This data is essential to clarify the active degrees of freedom variance and to get insight into the confident mechanism of light quartz. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have now time for questions, and the questions will be started by the reader of this experiment, and that's Steve Deitman. Please, Steve. Thanks. Uh, that was very nice uh, work, and I really appreciate all the effort you guys have put into this. I have a couple questions. Um, please uh, elucidate us a little better on why you think you should go from A minus to A, pluses and minuses in that. You know, what, what does it cost you at A minus, and what do you gain by being A? Uh, I would say probably that uh, uh, the reason is that uh, the uh, run group K, to our, um, to our opinion, as, is as important as a run group A uh, in assessing, uh, in, in addressing in a complete way the uh, key um, uh, topics that I have shown. Uh, I'm uh, scientific, uh, uh, scientific uh, rating A is uh, basically a guarantee that we will indeed uh, have access to the full statistics. Uh, that is definitely what we need, the full statistics. Do you think that if you're A minus, you will be delayed by years, or you know, like, like, like to be just a tad more quantitative. Uh, 
I think okay that that's actually uh, uh, the okay uh, the job of the of the management but uh, it is clear that the highest is the scientific rating highest is the priority that will be given to the data taking and uh, so as I said we opportunistically ran uh, for 10 days because uh, we are the only one uh, that can run when the beam is not available at the high um, at the highest energy in all B. Nobody else can run except us. So we accepted to run even at energy slightly different from the asset, from the um, uh, approved ones. But what is crucial to us is to get, you know, not um, a dispersed a small chunk of data that will be practically impossible to analyze with uh, appropriate uh, systematic errors. Systematic errors are crucial, especially for DCBCS. Uh, for combining uh, the different uh, data sets. So uh, uh, our feeling is that uh, the scientific rating A will kind of uh, mm, not guarantee but uh, give us enough priority to access to uh, data taking long enough to have all the uh, statistics and uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, mainly systematic uh, uh, quantities under control. Uh, the quality, actually, when we get the data that we're all continuously and nicely taken in December, uh, okay, the, the analysis and the calibration was quite straightforward, not only because it was a small amount of data, but also because it was quite uh, stable. And, uh, however, if we uh, have to combine this table data with data taken uh, in two years from now for another 10 days and stuff like that, um, it's, it will be very difficult for us to uh, have all the uh, systematics under control, and this is uh, crucial. Okay, um, switch to model dependence. Um, you can cut me off whenever you want, Marcus. Uh, I'm most interested in uh, the progress of Lattice. You you showed a mass spectrum. What's the prospect for them having uh, calculations of photocouplings? Sorry, this is not. Uh, excuse me, I have to mute this. Uh, uh, okay, so let me go here. Uh, actually, uh, to, to tell the truth, we don't have. Uh, we, we have tried to push the Lattice QCD uh, people to, uh, you know, expand or to uh, improve the calculations. May also, uh, to get the knowledge of what are like the uh, branching ratio of these uh, resonances into different channels, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So to, to have a better understanding where to look for this variant resonance. This was not in the do list of the uh, of our collaborators. Uh, we have a little bit more. Um, maybe I have a um, uh, like a backup slide at the end. Uh, I I can I think uh, here. Uh, I think what we are going to look for. Uh, and we already got in, in touch with the uh, reference uh, scientist, is to have uh, maybe a different approach from light front quark models and uh, uh, anti uh QCD calculations. Uh, a new publication from, from Roski and collaborators in press and other collaborators are willing to um, address um, uh, with these quark models uh, the problem of uh, identifying, uh, you know, the properties of these uh, um, hybrid resonances. We are also in contact with uh, Elena Santopint and her collaborators uh, using uh, uh, hypercentral quark models uh, to get a better insight. Uh, I've been told that it's very complicated. So almost everyone starts from mesons and not from variants. Uh, but uh, we are really pushing and uh, we have an agreement that uh, in the near future, new results uh, will come up, ex especially if we can match the prediction with our data. Okay, Diana? thanks. Uh, could you go back to slide seven? You made a strong statement about Q-squared dependence. 
or hybrids. What is the basis for that, those statements about strong Q-squared dependence showing a hybrid? Yeah, that is uh, results of the publication here, uh, dated back in the 1992. Uh, okay, I don't know if uh, uh, Volker who was part of the, uh, uh, of, um, among the authors can uh, answer better than me, but- Can, um, you, hear me? can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, uh, so <clears throat> the, I mean, the simple reason uh, to understand that is uh, that instead of having three uh, components, you know, like three quarks or considerant quarks, you have, ha have a fourth uh, considerant uh, component. And that basically already shows that uh, dimensional scaling will be a, a much more sharply dropping compared to three quarks. But that's not the only reason, of course. This uh, uh, this uh, yeah, publication is based on a, a quark model that has been extended uh, yeah, uh, to include the uh, yeah, considerant uh, yeah, glue. And the results was uh, that actually, and you can think in terms of uh, yeah, the coupling that's involved, that the scalar coupling actually should be uh, basically close to zero and to get this m much faster drop in Q-squared just you know, because of the, uh, for the the additional component that you have in the wave function. So that's in simple terms, sort of the the reason for that drop. Thank you very much, Volker. I think we need to move on now. Let's thank Annalisa again for her presentation and uh, replies to questions. Um, the next presentation is uh, given by Matthew Shepard on uh, an update on GlueX2 and the Etta factory. Please, Matthew. All right, uh, let me share my screen here. You can hear me okay, I assume. We hear you fine, and I see your screen. You see the screen? You're all okay. set to go. Very good. I'm going to reset my clock so I can uh, obey your time constraints. And I'll start. So I'll, I'm going to be telling you about the uh, GlueX2 and JLab Beta Factory experiments. Um, just a reminder of the proposals, and I apologize in advance for the number of words on the slide. I wanted to give you something to read in advance, so uh, uh, I'll try to go through them somewhat briefly. But uh, the GlueX2 uh, proposal was an extension of the core GlueX spectroscopy program, and the idea was to, was to extend the intensity of the experiment, take more statistics, and enhance the particle identification capability, um, and uh, in particular to explore strange final states. And the Jeff experiment was uh, an emphasis really on physics beyond the standard model, it, it one, one part, and then the other part on, uh, on strong interaction physics tests of chiral perturbation theory. Uh, and it focused uh, strictly on uh, rare and forbidden decays of eta and eta prime mesons. And the pack approved Jeff to run concurrently with GlueX2. Uh, Jeff requires a high resolution upgrade to the forward calorimeter, which we have not uh, completed yet. So uh, where we stand now is that GlueX2 has taken about uh, 60 of the 200 approved days uh, with uh, 22 uh, coming in the run that concluded this week. And Jeff has yet to take any of the 100 approved uh, pack days uh, because uh, we need to install the forward calorimeter. So just a quick reminder of the GlueX goals and some of the tools available for GlueX. So uh, one of the goals of GlueX, or you might say the motivating goal of GlueX was to search for the spectrum of hybrid mesons. So here I've sketched a lattice calculation, or not sketched, I've included a lattice calculation of the hybrid meson spectrum. Uh, the, um, there's a lot of discussion in literature about this state right here, the Pi-1-1600, which has exotic quantum numbers. Uh, in fact, the best experimental evidence we have is that this state exists. But if we really want to understand hybrid mesons, we need to understand the entire spectrum, which is all those states that have exotic quantum numbers, and also the hybrids over here in orange boxes that have normal quantum numbers that are embedded in the spectrum. Uh, and notice another feature of this lattice calculation I'll point out is that the isoscalers, uh, the calculation actually predicts the mixture of, of SS bar and non-SS bar. So that's something we can also test and verify with experiment, and that's part of the GlueX2 program. Uh, should we discover these states, we can, we can look at the, the core content. Uh, so one of the tools for doing this is so-called uh, uh, amplitude analysis or partial wave analysis, and here's a beautiful example from Compass. So you look at a mass spectrum, and it looks sort of smooth, but it has maybe some bumps and wiggles in it. And these big bumps and wiggles you can identify with states in the spectrum pretty easily. And then when one makes a full angular analysis, uh, one can uncover then the contribution from all the other quantum numbers, and then also associate these other quantum numbers with states in the spectrum. 
So this is the tool that uh, you know is the, is the primary tool for spectroscopy in the in the meson sector because it allows identification of quantum numbers and states, and that lets you then place them in the spectrum. So uh, just to summarize the key physics objectives, I've already spoken a little bit about that. So GLUEX2 is to extend the uh, hadron spectroscopy uh, program. Uh, it's an essential, I think, to really increase the statistical precision of the data set. So there, uh, eta prime pi is a is a is a very key final state. That's one of the um, where some of the most compelling evidence for hybrid mesons is from other experiments. And in in, in order to have statistical precision that that uh, rivals those experiments, uh, it's it's critical, I think, to to collect the full Blue X2 data set. Uh, we also need to improve purity in states that have. Uh, uh, Kaons in the final state, so we can look at these uh, SS bar systems and understand uh, their flavor content. Um, but more so, when you build a high statistics multipurpose data set or program, you enable all kinds of other things. So, you know, measuring this flavor content of hybrid mesons is important, but we can also look at doubly strange baryons. And there are other opportunities that just arise because you have these unique data. And a good example of that is our paper on JSI photo production. Uh, which uh, is the high, most highest cited GLUEX paper at this point, over 60 citations, uh, primarily because it limits this pentacork state and or provides information or insight into this pentacork state at LHCb. And so Jeff, uh, I said, is a, a focus on strong interaction physics. Uh, you can determine the light quark mass ratio with high precision. Uh, you can uh, validate uh, understanding of power perturbation theory through eta decay. And there's a program of physics beyond the center model and looking for sub uh, GEV dark matter and new uh, processes that are C violating but parity conserving. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the physics. Um, we were asked to answer this question on scientific importance. Has anything changed? Uh, I would say that the case is even uh, more compelling now than it was when they were proposed. And mainly in the GLUEX area, we see new results from, uh, from JPAC and COMPASS joint analyses, JPAC and crystal barrel that really point to this picture of a hybrid that couples to eta pi and eta prime pi, and we need to confirm that and study it in a new production mechanism and also try to uncover the remainder of the hybrids in the spectrum. And Lattice uh, QCD continues to advance, and the theory development surrounding uh, uh, production of hybrids continues to advance, so we can capitalize on all that. Uh, for Jeff, uh, it goes without saying, I think that searching for dark matter in the laboratory is probably one of the biggest uh, goals in particle physics at this point. Jeff extends this search in a new way. And uh, Jeff remains really unique in being able to study these rare decays because of the production kinematics of the eta. So some of the backgrounds in eta decay, conventional backgrounds like eta to three pi zero, are hard when the eta isn't highly boosted because there's very little uh, Q amongst the decay. Uh, and you can eliminate those backgrounds nicely by boosting the eta. And that's one thing that Jeff does. Uh, so it's, it's a unique uh, situation for looking for rare eta decays into all neutral states. So um, concerning the physics beyond the standard model, uh, as uh, as the proposal has evolved, the model space I think has also evolved, and people have uh, well, and and as searches for dark matter turn up empty, people think about new and creative ways to look for dark matter or find it. Uh, and so Jeff will search in a variety of ways, uh, and they have really interesting names that basically talk about their quantum numbers and how they couple to standard model particles. And so for the dark vector boson, you see this exclusion plot. Here's a coupling on this axis and a mass on this axis, and and Jeff will extend the reach uh, in a model independent way by a couple orders of magnitude. Uh, and the goal, uh, I mean, the common goal amongst all of these is to try to resolve some narrow structures in the okay, So the idea is that uh, eta would decay into some dark matter candidate, which then decays back into standard model particles, and you would see that as substructure through these decays. Um, uh, so that's the dark matter search. There's an additional thrust in physics beyond the standard model by looking for these C-violating decays, parity-conserving eta decays. And all this really hinges on having this high-resolution, high-granularity calorimeter to be able to do this uh, physics. So to speak just a little bit about the hybrid program in GLUEX, some of the initial results from GLUEX are focused on uh, production of, of, uh, of mesons. It's kind of the thing that you start with, understanding photo production models. And a lot of this has been done with our colleagues at, at JPAC. Uh, so we've, we've uh, published papers now on a variety of reactions, production of pi zero, eta, eta prime, k plus against a sigma, and just recently uh, pi minus against a delta plus plus. And the thing to point out is, uh, so one can measure this quantity, the BMA symmetry, and that tells you about the quantum numbers of the exchange process up here. In general, that has a that has a T dependence. It depends on momentum transfer. So for the pi minus, you see at low T it's consistent with uh, kind of pi on exchange, and then it transitions to more of like a vector exchange. And so um, 
you, you might think that also hybrid mesons would have a T dependence, and you'd like to be able to study that. And in order to study that, you need to be able to uh, to be able to analyze the data and bins of T, and that really requires high statistics. So if we really want to do this full, complete program of hybrid spectroscopy, should we should we discover hybrids? Uh, having the statistics to do this kind of T dependent analysis is really important. Uh, so I enclose here this table to talk about the search for hybrids. I want to show you this table from PAC 42. Uh, and um, we, uh, when we submitted the proposal, we, we thought about relevant decays we might look for and what final states they may decay into. And here's a list of all the exotic uh, uh, hybrids here. And maybe what the widths are. This is some model-dependent, uh, uh, you know, estimate of what the widths are. And we've sort of marked some of these with daggers that that have narrow states. So F1 is pretty narrow. The K stars are fairly narrow. So you might think that these are good candidates to look for. In general, these are these are difficult final states to analyze. You know, rho pi and F1 pi and things like that. So, uh, so I, and I also want to highlight. Sorry, this uh, thing keeps appearing on the bottom left. I'll, uh, but I, I want to highlight the new results from uh, on hybrid couplings at spec just this week on uh, the exotic Pi-1 and, and the favored decay, decay channel. So that's actually an interesting paper, and it's got our attention. Uh, but this talk was written before that. So, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about this final, uh, the, these various final states. Uh, one thing we can do, uh, you know, we have this kind of very robust framework of kinematic fitting and event selection and standardize, standardization. And so in one uh, process, we can run over a third of the GLUEX data and reconstruct over 50 different final states. Then you just go through and you plot all the various invariant mass spectra, out pops this, you know, 1,300 page PDF, and you can sit down and try to look for these uh, various things. So if you're going to look for F1 uh, eta, it should decay to eta pi pi. And we can look at production of eta pi pi. And when you do that, you see no clear F1. So that's probably not a, a channel that you're immediately going to send your graduate student off to go uh, try to analyze because uh, it looks uh, a little bit hard. Um, on the other hand, and that's fine, you're guessing at this. Uh, it's a discovery experiment. So sometimes you, you guess and you, and you don't guess correctly. On the other hand, if you look at K star K or K2 K, I mean, there's a nice signal here for K star K and K2 K. And if I look at the K, K pi and varying mass spectrum, I see some nice structure. And so this is something that we definitely want to follow up on, try to understand what portion of this invariant mass spectrum arises from K2 star K resonances and K star K resonances, and what those quantum numbers are, because those are potential hybrid decay modes. Um, so to do this, we need statistics. Obviously, this is a third of the data we have in the tank, and there's not a whole lot of K2 stars here. And with the full GLUEX data, we would, we would take this up to about a factor of 10 to 15 times. And uh, we also need to push down these backgrounds. The blue shaded things are backgrounds that come from uh, misidentified pions as kaons. And so we need to reduce those, and that's what the improved particle ID will do. Uh, so, uh, right, so let's keep on moving. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the search strategy for hybrids. Uh, so I'm not going to go through every box and explain what's in these boxes, but this is the what we're doing right now to in this very high high uh, priority or high emphasis channel of eta pi and eta prime pi. So we have about four PhD students and a couple postdocs, and uh, we collaborate, have regular meetings with our theory colleagues in JPAC. Um, and you know, many pieces have to come together to do this. We have to have a good model of the detector and how it works. We need to be able to select events. We need to have a robust amplitude analysis framework to extract the partial waves and so on. But the one thing I want to emphasize is that once we, we get these pieces figured out, uh, it's much easier to turn the crank on another channel with the slightly different quantum numbers. Uh, and um, so we're really, uh, the emphasis is on this uh, uh, robust scalable framework that we can use again and again and again, because we need a complete exploration of the data set. That's uh, our goal. So I want to uh, conclude this bit uh, by about the physics and, and motivation by just saying a little bit uh, more about readiness for analysis. So um, I, I made this point earlier that I think the GLUEX2 and Jeff programs uh, are strong, if not stronger, the motivation is than, uh, than when these initiatives were developed. Uh, for the hybrid program, I think we're seeing a beautiful convergence of data phenomenology through, uh, through JPAC efforts and Lattice QCD. And these all have very different roles in uh, letting us understand the spectrum of mesons. That's all coming together at the same time, which is quite exciting. Uh, and Jeff has this uh, uh, very neat opportunity to search for uh, physics beyond the standard model in a new way. So that's a great opportunity we should take advantage of. 
So all these things use the existing anal analysis infrastructure that's uh, been developed over many, many years and supported and maintained by the collaboration. In fact, the charge pi and polarizability after, uh, that speaks after this will use all the same framework. Uh, so it's a workflow that's, that uh, you know, has to scale to be able to analyze many, many petabytes of data and, and uh, reconstructing it takes hundreds of millions of CPU hours. So we figured out how to do that and do that successfully and efficiently. Um, and do it in a way where we can apply those tools to many different types of, of analyses. Uh, so, um, so we're in a good position there. It's taken some time to, to get there, and it will take some time. But, but uh, uh, the result of that is, is a robust framework that's versatile and can be used for a variety of physics objectives. So I want to speak a little bit about the detector up upgrades. Uh, so two things is the addition of a DERC and this high-resolution calorimeter insert. So the baseline detector, uh, we are in the process of publishing a NIM paper on that. Uh, so that's documented and well understood. And then uh, we've just add these, these new changes. So the DERC, uh, one of the design goals of the DERC was to improve pi and kaon separation up to about four GeV. And we make use of, uh, of actually recycled components from the Babar DERC. So this was uh, huge to get these uh, few silica radiators and the idea is that, uh, is that you preserve the shrink-off angle as they bounce down these bars, and then you can image the shrink-off photons. And so we built a new optical camera to do that, but we reuse this core component, which are these very pristine uh, uh, fused silica bars. There are four of these bar boxes, each with 12 uh, long, uh, five-meter long bars inside of the GLUX installation. We had to get them to JLab. That was no small feat. Uh, they were stored at Babar. We had to ship them across the country. We moved one once to verify that we could do it and then moved all three. Um, and so here they are on the road. Uh, I would call this a very, very long and uh, careful drive, not a long and very, very careful drive. Uh, but my colleague wrote this slide. Um, I'm, I'm in the left seat here. So uh, it was quite an adventure, but we did it. We got the uh, bars installed and, uh, and got the detector commissioned. And so Marcus doesn't have to interrupt me. I see that I have uh, I have five minutes and 15 seconds left if I'm calculating correctly. Um, so the Dirk performance. So this is uh, some of the initial performance with the data we collected this spring. Uh, so on the on the right, you see these uh, shrink off ring uh, uh, shrink off ring images on the PMT plane. So the top is from data. The bottom is from Monte Carlo. Uh, they look very similar as they should, means so we can model the uh, the performance of the detector well. And using just a small subset of the da data and preliminary alignment and so on, this is that uh, K-Pi channel. This doesn't use any kinematic fittings. So you're only looking at the, at the PID performance of the DERC. And this is, on the left is before you uh, uh, require a DERC for PID, and on the right is with the DERC. And so you see you greatly enhance the signal to background. Uh, and we anticipate this will get better and better as, uh, as time goes on and we better understand the alignment. But we really need the statistics of the full data set we collected this year improvement and refine the algorithm. All right, so now I want to speak a little bit about the calorimeter insert. Uh, so this is the goal is to insert in the in the middle of the existing lead glass calorimeter a high resolution 50 by 50 array of lead tungstate. state. Um, a, a key to K for that Jeff physics program is say eta to pi zero gamma gamma, and there's a huge background due to eta to three pi zero, uh, and you can see that in the preliminary GLUEX data, and and it happens just because you have overlapping photons or uh, and and they merge together and you end up with this background. But with the improved granularity and resolution, that background gets shoved down to low invariant mass, and then you can actually extract the signal. So this is a simulation, of course, but we haven't built the detector yet. But we've started procuring uh, crystals. The uh, modules are all designed, and we're just about ready to begin, I think, mass production of this detector. Uh, it's informed by lots of experience. So there's experience uh, uh, in, in our team with the hybrid uh, Hall B calorimeter, uh, recently in collaboration with Hall C, uh, uh, we built a Compton calorimeter for the Primex experiment to do um, to do uh, to measure Compton scattering as a way to normalize the luminosity, and so this was a very successful operation, and it uses basically the Jeff module design. And here you can see the signal for Compton events, where the energy is shared, uh, the electron or photon goes into either the comp cal or the f cal or calorimeter, and you see there's a no a peak at zero difference with the beam energy. So this has all worked, I think, uh, uh, very well. And we've continued to test these uh, modules uh, in Hall D and refine the electronics design, and we're ready to begin mass production. Uh, so here's just a variety of, of uh, pictures from the testing, checking the dimensions of the crystals and measuring the light yield uh, and the light transmission. And we test them full modules. We can do this in 
using the uh, kind of spent electrons and positrons from our spare pair spectrometer uh, in Hall B. Right, the plan for fabrication installation is coming together and is uh, uh, being finalized. So we expect, as I said, to begin mass production of the modules. And we're finalizing the engineering design of the frame. Uh, uh, there are some thermal considerations. The light output of lead tungstate is temperature dependent, so one has to uh, uh, control the temperature quite well. And one will need to uh, will need to unstack and restack the entire forward calorimeter and have a procedure for doing that and getting all the alignment correct. And, and that's uh, all being refined. Uh, and we anticipate the modules be re ready for installation around 2023. And uh, the installation process will take uh, about six months. All right, so to uh, summarize in the uh, little over a minute left, so Gluex and Jeff will uh, expand the initial baseline physics program. So uh, you kind of open up the window to this new spectroscopy of looking at things that decay to kaons uh, and decaying the kaons, those particles are all, uh, the production cross sections are typically all down. So you need additional high statistics data to be able to do that and also additional detector capability to be able to, um, to push down the pi on backgrounds and, and identify those with purity. Uh, so we'll have this interesting new uh, program to search for physics beyond the standard model using the Jeff experiment. Uh, and many of the key detector upgrades we need to do this are completed or well underway. So the, uh, the DERC is, uh, has been fully designed, construction, constructed, installed, uh, and now we're at the stage of, uh, of final uh, developing the reconstruction algorithms and calibration and alignment and so on. Uh, the construction phase of the high resolution calorimeter is just beginning. and uh, the design is developed and that builds on a lot of work. Together, if you think about these two projects, it's, it's over a decade of R&D design and construction and significant capital costs, several million dollars uh, invested in these two detectors. Uh, so at this stage, we've collected about 60 of the 200 approved pack days. Uh, they were completed, as I said, as of this week with the, with the uh, wrapping up of the run. And our request is to complete the proposed running program uh, for both these experiments as, as it was pro uh, proposed and approved by the PAC. And, sh and should it be needed, we will be back to the PAC to request additional time to achieve the scientific objectives of both these programs. So uh, with that, I'll close. I think that's 20 minutes. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying so well in time. Uh, the floor is now to Shinya Savada, who is the reader of this proposal, please. All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Well, I have a, a few questions. And the first question is that what are the major factors of limiting the speed of the uh, uh, calorimeter upgrades? Is it uh, manpower or funding or whatever? Uh, so the major factor, I think, limiting the speed of the calorimeter upgrades is the procurement of the components. Uh, so the co procurement has to be you know, spread over a couple of years. Uh, there's also just uh, the fabrication rate. And by the way, my colleagues who are, who are doing this are online. And they uh, but also the, uh, the fabrication rate of the crystals at the, at the various factories. Um, and uh, you know, there's an additional element of uncertainty, obviously, due to the, due to the pandemic, because uh, uh, these you know, factories are in Europe and in, and in Shanghai. And so uh, it, it was already planned to be procured over several years. And I think there's uh, you know, an extra plus or minus uncertainty there. All right. So uh, the uh, your uh, uh, best estimate of the completion year of the 2023 might be a bit delayed. Well, I, th I think it's maybe premature to say. It, well, yeah, it might be. Anything could happen. Uh, it's probably <laughs> not to get up. But uh, 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 right now, as of this moment, we are on track. Everything is on track, uh, and uh, and we are. You know the. To our knowledge, the factory in Shanghai has restarted production. Uh, we just heard this week our colleague in Wuhan is going to Shanghai to, uh, to uh, examine more crystals. So uh, right now there is uh, no indication of a delay. But okay, yeah, right. Okay, so uh, you showed the uh, Dirk uh, performance, the very initial performance of the Dirk. But, right. uh, uh, can we think that the other detectors, except for the upgraded uh, perimeter, works well? Yes, yes. You're worried about like aging of detectors or what? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I guess maybe I don't quite understand the nature of the, of the question. 
Okay, so you you have you have uh, original Google X detectors, right? That's right. That's right. And uh, uh, you didn't show any performance of, of the detectors, but uh, but I, I guess those detectors works well, work well. But uh, is it right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, and the reason I didn't show that is because that was that was really part of the initial Gluex construction, and so uh, I wanted to emphasize what was uh, what was new with this uh, proposal. But uh -huh. yeah, those, those detectors and the performance of those detectors. I mean, there are some small things like uh, uh, you know we've we have to change photo tubes in the time of flight because they have a lifetime, uh, and and we've done some segmentation changes in places. But but in leading order, the the rest of the detector system works as designed, and we anticipate it will continue to work as designed throughout the duration of the program. All right. So the, my last question is that uh, uh, you took data for 60 days. It's almost a one third of the approved uh, PAC days. Right. And, uh, uh, and maybe you will take data for yeah, in the coming years, 2021, 20, 2022, 2023. So, uh, are you going to finalize uh, your, some of your analysis before the uh, uh, Jeff experiment starts in uh, maybe in 2024 or so? Uh, yeah, I think, I think there will be. So, uh, first of all, in 2021, we don't anticipate running the, the Glue X2 program in 2021. There are, uh, the Primex ADA program will likely run in Haldi in 2021. There's an experiment for uh, uh, to study short range correlations. Uh, but I think the answer to your question is uh, yes. Some you know some analyses uh, are high impact and maybe not statistics limited, and those you would want to uh, uh, you know finalize and publish as soon as you possibly can. Uh, other analyses where you're looking at rare processes would depend on the, uh, you know, would benefit from having the full data set. So I think you, you do this on a topic by topic basis uh, based on what you know about the schedule and the data in hand. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any question from any other member of the PIC? I do not hear anything. Then let us thank Matthew again. Um, Thanks. Uh, we, are, we are now five minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, unless there is any protest against, I would just continue with the next presentation so we can gain a little time, which might be uh, useful later on. Uh, the last presentation of this session is given by Rory Miskimen and he gives an upgrade on the experiment to measure the pion polarization in Hall B. Please, Lord Rory, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay. Uh, can you see that? I see your screen. Um, okay, great. Okay. So I was going to use my iPad this morning, and the iPad doesn't work, so I had to switch to my MacBook. The slideshow. Okay. Um, so um, we don't see your talk I'm yet. Do you see it yet? No. No. Okay. We see, see your you see this? event window in. When you shared, did you select entire screen? Okay, let me try to stop sharing. Okay, so I'll try to share a screen. And I'll click entire screen. I start sharing. Oh, do, you, do you see this? We see your screen, but not the talk. Maybe uh, try to share only your talk and nothing else. Okay. Just try to share. Just 
message preview. How about that? Can you see that? No. Rory, I'm going to pull up your slides and I'm going to share them. Okay. Just need to upload it from here. All right, so just make sure you give me cues to advance slides because I won't see any okay. of them on the screen, okay? Okay, so I don't I don't see the slides. I don't either, Lorelai. Yeah, Lorelai, we don't see your slides. Now we do. Now we see them. Then go ahead, um, Rory. We are on the first slide. Right. So do you see the entire slide I'm cut off on the bottom? I still cut off. Okay, that's it. All right. So okay, sorry, sorry for this. I had this all set up on the iPad. It worked beautifully, and then this app this app won't run on the iPad. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, I'm going to uh, discuss the Pion uh, polarizability experiment in Hall D. And I'm going to give just a over, quick overview of the experimental goals, update on calculations, new results, and then uh, largely spend my time discussing sort of preparations for the, for the polarizability experiment. Uh, so, so Susan, is that, can we go to the next slide? Okay, all right. So it's interesting to consider a thought experiment where you place a, in this case, a pion in a parallel plate capacitor at very high electric field. So you can imagine that the pion, of course, is surrounded by a pion cloud. And if you apply a very high electric field, that this pion cloud is gonna distort, it's gonna move away from the pion core. And this is very much akin to what you see in uh, electrostatics dielectric materials. Now, atoms and molecules are actually quite uh, squishy, whereas uh, hadrons are extremely stiff because of strong nuclear force. But nevertheless, you can consider doing this sort of thought experiment. And the, the uh, dielectric displacement goes as the polarizability times the applied electric field. Now, if you consider the electric field you need to do this, however, it's prohibitive that you can make some rough uh, order of magnitude estimates of what you would need to displace the pion cloud. It's of the order of about probably 10 to 23 volts per meter. That would be the electric field that you'd probably need to do that. So hadrons, this is because hadrons are extremely stiff. And when you look at the polarizabilities, typically polarizabilities are of order of the volume of the system, very typically in terms of atoms and molecules. In the case of hadrons, they're like 10 minus 4 times the volume. So they're, they're rather small numbers. The polarizabilities are small effects. In very qualitative terms, we know that elastic form factors tell us about ground state properties in general. Uh, in a qualitative sense, what the polarizabilities are telling us, they're telling us, providing information about the excited states of the hadrons. So can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, this is a large and active field in general, hadron polarizabilities. And what we can say by and large is the charge pion polarizability probably ranks as the most constrained theoretical prediction. The P fourth prediction, uh, which comes out of the, the QCD Lagrangian, the low energy QCD Lagrangian is governed by two low energy constants, which are related to the radiative decay of the pion. And the prediction that comes from that is the, the electric and magnetic polarizabilities are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. Uh, the, P, uh, the, the order P6 prediction also seems to be small. This is the prediction that we have. So in general, what I would say is, is that this is a really kind of gold, gold standard test for, uh, for using the polarizability to test the prediction of low energy QCD. So if we had a pion target, 
what we would do is we use Compton scattering to, to test this prediction is what we would do. So let's go to the next slide. But we don't. So we have to use some other technique. So the technique that we're pursuing at JLab is a theoretical technique is to use crossing symmetry to relate Compton scattering cross sections on the pion to two photon collision leading to a pi pi final state. So, and using dispersion theory to connect these two. Now, and here at JLab, what we're going to use, we'll use the Primakov reaction to measure this gamma gamma go to pi pi cross section is what we'll do. And that's indicated in that cartoon that you see on this particular slide. Now, the connection then between the Primakov cross section and the, uh, the gamma gamma collision cross section is, is related through some kinematic factors, which are shown on the bottom of the plot, uh, which basically sort of encodes the dynamics of the problem, also, polar, also the photon polarization effect, but also the cross section is there, the cross section for gamma gamma go to pi pi. So by measuring these Primakov cross sections, we can get a handle on this gamma gamma go to pi pi cross section. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, so this is essentially the world's data on gamma gamma with a pi pi, the charge, the charge final state that is. Um, <clears throat> this comes from the block data points are from the Mark II data. And uh, it's plotted, the cross section is plotted as a function of the two pine invariant mass on the, on the horizontal axis. The curves show various sensitivity to the polarizabilities. Okay. So the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the, the plot, I think I've labeled the OP6 prediction incorrectly, it's actually 5.7. It's that blue dash curve is what that is. And also shown are the projected data points from the JLab experiment is what we see. So this reaction does have uh, reasonable sensitivity to polarizabilities in the threshold region, actually fairly comparable to what you see in Compton scattering cross sections, by the way. It's, it's, fairly, it's fairly similar to that. And the projected uncertainty we had in this analysis, this is what was shown actually at the PAC proposal, uh, this order about plus or minus 0.6 in these standard units, which would correspond to an error of about 10% in alpha minus beta. Let's go to the next slide, please. I want to give you an update on theoretical calculations. So it's there, these are important steps to go from from a Compton scattering cross section to these photon photon cross sections, and you, it's important to use dispersion uh, calculations for doing that. So, since the, the PAC approval, there have been uh, three important uh, calculations come out. So, I would say, so to speak, the first modern calculations process was by Barbara Pasquini. And this is this is what was used in the uh, proposal uh, development. Uh, some years later, Di and Pennington came out with their own independent analysis of gamma gamma go to pi pi and the sensitivity of these cross sections to the polarizabilities. And really, most recently, Mark van der Hagen has, uh, is working in this effort also, uh, gamma gamma go to uh, pseudoscalar mesons, uh, including the pion, uh, in the context of hadronic light by light contributions to mu on g minus 2. But for us, this is also important because he's calculating gamma gamma go to pi pi. Well, let's go to the next slide, please. These are, this is the landscape of experimental results on this, on the charge pi and polarizability. I'm just going to focus on two of them. One is the MAMI result from MINES and also, and then the most recent is actually from COMPASS is, is what we have. Um, by and large, these experiments, they agree, these two minds and compass agree within about two standard deviations with each other. So it's not really entirely accurate to say one is right and the other is wrong. They're, they're, they agree within two sigma is what they do. I would characterize them as essentially bracketing the theoretical prediction, which is labeled as chi PT uh, on, on this plot. Um, I will say the people at Mainz think their number is correct. You, got, you talk them about it. They say that's the right number. Okay. Whereas, of course, the people on Compass say their number is correct also. But they do agree within two standard deviations. 
Uh, just to focus a little bit on the compass result, uh, they used uh, the Primakov uh, pion reaction, so they did 160 GeV pions on nickel target uh, and did radiative pion production. And the experiment, by and large, is, has sensitivity to polarizability, really at the very highest final photon energies of the reaction, up near the, near the beam energy. Um, which is also where they had backgrounds from pi zeros also, which they, they clearly admit. Uh, the result they had is, 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 is listed there. Uh, if you combine systematics and, and uh, statistics and quadrature, you get about an error of 50%. So our conclusion is that the JLAP and COMPASS experiments have very different backgrounds and systematic errors. And our conclusion is these two experiments, the JLAP and COMPASS, are, are really are quite complementary. Right, the next slide, please. So the plan is, is that the charge pi and polarizability will run concurrently with the recently approved neutron pi and polarizability experiment, which was approved by this PAC, actually, PAC 48. So we can actually think about a program now. So the goals for the pi and polarizability program are really to make the first ever measurement of neutron pi and polarizability and also make a precision measurement for the charge pi and polarizability, which to my mind is probably the most theoretically constrained of hadron polarizabilities. Uh, can the next slide, please? So I want to discuss now, uh, take the rest of my uh, time to talk about preparations for running the experiment. A significant background we have are beta high order backgrounds, both for electrons and muons. The muon background, we're developing some muon chambers, which we can use to identify muons and, and then reject them. The way this was done is we did hundreds of different combinations of detectors and iron absorbers, and that's what's shown on the right, or rather the left, with different, uh, different combinations of detectors and iron, and then plotting out the muon rejection at a fixed point acceptance. So literally hundreds of different sort of giant simulations we ran, and we, did, we discovered that the combination of iron absorbers with detectors on the right, kind of the diagram on the right, gives us the uh, rejection uh, that, that we need. Can I go to the next slide, please? So the muon chambers are well, under, well underway. They're nearly finished. They're being constructed here at UMass. We're building eight of them. So in fact, we only need six of them for, for the experiment. And these are the parameters for the detectors here. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2018, we took a full-scale prototype detector. We put it into Hall D at the very, very end of the beam line, where it was essentially subjected to the full brunt of all the, of all the backgrounds come down the beam line from, from Glue -X, the Glue-X detector with no shielding in front. Um, and so the detector worked. It, it operated, uh, and we could track we could track particles. The rates were acceptable. The, the chamber currents were also acceptable. Next slide, please. These are the EMAS undergraduates have contributed to this program. I just I just mentioned this. We have an extremely talented group at EMAS who have worked on this, who have gone on to do some very uh, very gone to very, very nice careers in, in a number of different academic areas and also industrial areas. You have three minutes left. Okay, next slide. So the engineering design studies for Hall D, they're, they're also uh, well underway, and we've done procurement of parts for, for the detectors. Next slide, please. We've done a, we've started a neural net analysis for particle ID in the experiment where we focused on E pi separation using the forward calorimeter. Uh, the plot on the bottom shows the, uh, the neural net response for electrons and pions. In this case, we're using actual real data from, from GUEX to, to train these neural nets. Next slide. And I'll just focus on the left plot. So the left plot, Left column shows uh, uh, gamma p go to e plus e minus, uh, and it shows the beta height peak, and then a little row zero peak, and then after we do the identification, we can cleanly separate out electrons versus pions. Next slide. 
Uh, the, uh, also very important is developing a trigger for the experiment. We've, uh, this experiment will use a non-standard GLUX trigger, which is based on the time of flight system. And we had a trigger test really just last month on this. And what's shown on the plot on the right is we've done a number of different studies in that test, but for example, we swept out and measured the trigger rate versus the beam current. Uh, and at the nominal current for the experiment, we got a trigger rate of about 30 kilohertz, which is well within our acceptable range. Okay, next slide. I'm coming down the home stretch here. So for the, the, the trigger studies, the questions we've answered so far is this 30 kilohertz trigger rate at the nominal CPP current is within the operational range of the DAC system. So this will work. Uh, we also, I didn't have time to explain this, but we also put lead absorbers in front of the time of flight system to see if we needed to knock it down knock down the rate, and it seems like those absorbers are not needed. Uh, and we think it's very likely we can run CPP at a, at a higher beam current than 20 nanoamps. Okay, next slide. And this is the summary. Okay, so again, precision test of, uh, of a hadron polarizability, which is probably the most constrained theoretically, uh, develop techniques which are complementary to compass and mines. Uh, also measuring neutron pi and polarizability, measuring cross sections that constrain hadronic light by light corrections from muon G minus two, and then you see there the summary of our, our preparations. The muon system is being finalized. The engineering for detector installation is pretty very very far along at this point. We're using real GLUX data to to really understand how to do the particle ID, which will be essential for the experiment. And we have an acceptable time of flight trigger for the experiment. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rory. The reader of this experiment is Charlotte Elster, and she has time now for asking questions. Please, Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the update and stuff. And I saw you have got a lot of technical development in. Uh, I got a little bit confused. You were approved for 25 days, but you haven't used a single day of that. Right. So, correct? yeah, that's correct. You're correct. We haven't used any days yet. Correct. Okay. The other thing, I mean, it's I was impressed that the theory community picked up and did calculation, but you showed still the same figure. Uh, I mean, uh, the, as you showed for, uh, the, with the calculation of Barbara Pasquini, as you showed in your original proposal. Because what I did, I mean, I've, I went back and found the original proposal and read that too. Uh, is there any new calculation very specifically to that figure? You showed the figure yeah. again at the beginning of your talk. Yeah, so uh, that's sort of the projected data points. I think you're probably asking about. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. no, we haven't, uh, yeah, that's a good point, but we haven't actually gone back and, and gone, uh, sort of done that exercise, I would say. I would say in general though, the dispersion theories of Pasquini and Pennington, they're not so different, I would say. Um, Barbara has said, Barbara's basically said that we should be using really Pennington's calculation, what she's told me. But I think in general, these dispersion calculations are going to come in about at about the same level of sensitivity. But, you know, we haven't had time, kind of, so to speak, to go back and kind of repeat that whole exercise with, uh, you know, maybe the latest and, and final version of the dispersion calculations. Okay. And then you said uh, you changed the target from a tin to a lead. And I know lead is doubly magic and stuff. So what uh, can you elaborate on, on that? I mean, I guess at the end, a lead target is also easy to get. But what was your uh, reasoning for changing that? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so what we did is one of the important backgrounds in the experiment is going to be the row zero photo production is, is, is what it's going to be. Um, and what we did is we basically went through a sort of single the background study of the Primakov signal versus this row zero. And generally what you find is you go to higher and higher mass numbers, the signal the background starts to get better for you. Or generally as you go to higher, higher mass numbers is what we found. So 10 maybe isn't really so terribly different than lead, but lead seemed to be a little bit better is what I would say. Um, also in the Primus experiment, we had really great success in Primakov on lead. It was a, it was, it just worked really, really well for us. And uh, we we're, you know, we're leveraging that experience on Primex to this experiment. So 
that was the choice. I would say it's not a huge difference, but it seemed to be a better a better thing with the background situation. Okay. And the other thing, I mean, it's uh, between the original proposal and now, I, I mean, just reading it as a theorist, no? it looks to me that right now you are actually in a position that you can make a definite prediction when you will be ready to be on the floor. Is that correct? Right. So I think at this point, uh, you know, of course, everything's COVID related, right? Um, yeah. Well, okay. Let's yeah. that, let's put a factor on this. But I mean, it it looks. I mean, now. Uh, I mean, uh, supposedly everything works well. When would you be ready to put the experiment on the floor and get it running? Um, so I think what we have, sort of, uh, you know, Matt can maybe talk more about that and, and Eugene. But I think probably 2022. It's really it really comes. I mean, when we could be ready. I mean, in principle, we could be ready next year, I think. Uh, but I think they're in Hall D, they want to run uh, Prime X and maybe a short range correlation experiment. So, kind of the calendar is opening up for us to do this in 2022. It's important for us that we want to do this experiment before they take the calorimeter apart for this Jeff upgrade, I would say. So, okay. we really want to get in before the upgrade. That's That's kind of our time scale. Okay, because that that is kind of important. Uh, I mean, now uh, since Jeopardy means it has to be kept on the book, we can also change uh, the rating and stuff. And that's why I think uh, I mean that is useful information for us to know when you are ready and your own time constraint when you want to be put on. Because I saw you put a lot of more effort in and with the data analysis and stuff, and in theory also thought, uh, thought it's uh, important. So now the uh, the experiment is, is kind of on the brink of really taking place. And I think in, in Jeopardy, that is what we have to take into consideration. Okay, great. Yeah. That's why I'm putting now right. you to, yeah. to actually say, when do you want to be? Are you ready? So you say 2022, and you're really ready to get going. Forget, I mean, COVID may shift everything. Right, right, right. No, I think, well, I think, it, uh, you know, given what's going on in Hall D right now, uh, I would say 2022 is a, a very good time for us to run. Okay, thank you. Th these were my questions. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Rory and thanks also to Lorelei for chiming in and helping the slides. Uh, we now suspend the open session. Uh, the open session resumes at 10 o'clock uh, Jefferson Lab time. The PAC uh, switches over to the normal blue jeans. Please use the link that um, Susan has sent to us yesterday. And uh, for all others, uh, see you again at 10 o'clock. <laughs>